Hello, everyone. It's great to be here uh, hosting this fantastic conversation, a plenary conversation, envisioning Indian narratives. India, through its development path, has become a land of opportunity. Its diversity leads to distinctive prospects, which need careful nurturing, however. What changes might be beneficial to India's future? What narratives will accelerate India into a post-COVID digital age? To answer those questions and much, much more, we are going to be joined, we are joined by uh, Nasser Munji, Chairman of Development Credit Bank of India, Anish Shah, Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer of Mahindra and Mahindra in India, and Deborah Wynne Smith, President of the United States Council on Competitiveness, Competitiveness in the USA. I'm Clifton Leaf, I'm the former editor in chief of Fortune magazine uh, in the USA. Um, we will hopefully be joined by two more uh, panelists Dr. Murtaza Kurakabala, Managing Director of Walkart India, and Sunil Mehta, the Chairman of Yes Bank. Um, so when those uh, two guests join, we'll, we'll just sort of work them into the conversation. But Anish, I want to start with you, if I might, because um, this past month, I think it was, there was, um, oh, we have a, a Dr. Murtaza uh, Korekwala, fantastic. Um, we're so glad you're, you're part of this, uh, we're part, you're part of this conversation now. Um, Anish, you know, there was a fantastic little snippet, uh, a little write-up about your parents. Um you know, from the India Institute of Management. Um, and, and all three of you, your, both your mother and your father are graduates of this. And when you talk about narratives, we often talk that we need a, a past, a present, and a future. We need some sort of continuity. And so I'm interested if, if maybe you could talk a little bit about what is the continuity between, what's changed really between your parents' generation of managing businesses, your father, of course, helped launch the pharmaceutical industry in India. It was very, very uh, influential in that regard and, and has a lot of uh, amazing achievements to his credit, which is amazing. Uh, so what's what's different from then and now? And or, or and what's changed? And also, if you would, what has remained the same that you wish would change in the culture? So let's start with those two questions. So Clifton, quite remarkable first that uh, you picked up this snippet but uh, let me share a couple of narratives from there. Uh, my father spent uh, much of his career with Pfizer, um, was a deputy managing director in India, and then spent the second half of his career really with uh, the Indian pharmaceutical industry and uh, helped grow that. So the narrative in that really is around uh, India standing on its own feet and develop its own, developing a very competitive industry in the world. And uh, the Indian pharma industry today uh, is among the best in the world and very well positioned. Uh, my mother uh, was one of two women uh, in her class at IIM Ahmedabad. She was in the second batch. My father was in the first batch. And uh, that in itself uh, talks about uh, diversity and where India's come today from where it was. And uh, she started her own business in the late 60s. Wow. Uh, and uh, an entrepreneur in India, in the late 60s, had a lot more challenges than an entrepreneur in India today. So there again, India has come a very long way in terms of uh, the ability that youngsters graduating from uh, top colleges or anyone else, frankly, uh, have in, able, in able, being able to set up their own businesses and some very successful businesses at that. We are seeing some uh, crazy valuations from uh, many of the startups now, which did not happen at that point in time, unfortunately. <laughs> but uh, I think the key things here are, uh, to summarize, India really stands on its feet and developing world-class industries, uh, diversity coming a long way from where it was at that point, uh, and the entrepreneurship uh, that uh, India is exhibiting. And to your last question, uh, in terms of what should change, um, I would say that it's the... Uh, Next, jump with regard to the infrastructure in India. Mm. Uh, I think a lot of good steps have been taken, uh, but I think that's one step that will make Indian industries a lot more competitive to be able to sell globally. You know, that's a fantastic comment and a perfect transition to Nasser because, you know, from, from uh, 
your experience working at a development bank, um, you know, we, we talk about narratives, for example, you have a protagonist of the story, uh, which is a, fills a very large cast of characters. It's 1.36 billion people or so, right? Um, uh, the Indian population. But, you know, their access to capital is not in any way even. We have a very big gap between rich and poor. There is a, an enormous uh, development challenge here. So, uh, Nasser, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how that narrative is changing. Well, you know, I think uh, access to capital has changed dramatically now at all levels. I'm also a chairman of a uh, NGO, and I'm very much in that in the NGO world for many, many years, 30 years. And you're seeing microfinance now taken off in the last 15 years. There isn't a there isn't a village in South India, for example, without women's, women's groups. Uh, so actually, capital is really getting down to the, you know, very, uh, and the entrepreneurial talent we're seeing coming up uh, is sort of mimicking some of the stuff that's happening in the wider Indian economy. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, there's a huge energy here that needs to be tapped. Um, but I think uh, on infrastructure, I was involved very much uh, in when I created, we created IDFC in uh, 1997 to 2004. And that was the time when we brought private capital into infrastructure mm. because 99% of all infrastructure was government owned and managed. So our task was how do we bring in commercially viable infrastructure projects and actually open up the sector. And what you saw was the airports, the ports, the, the golden quadrilateral road project. You saw the uh, uh, power distribution reforms, uh, the telecom, uh, opening up of telecom. Uh, so we were involved with all of that space. So by 2004, that had moved very, very well. And today in India, whatever infrastructure you see was begun at that period. Uh, and in a sense, uh, uh, I totally, uh, with uh, Anish, India today needs a different quality and of infrastructure yeah. as we move forward. If we are going to be uh, competitive, especially in logistics um, and power, yeah. um, you know, so in a sense, there's some really good news on power because on renewable energy, uh, we are very much up there in terms of um in terms, in terms of, we're the third largest consumer of electricity, uh, and about thirty-eight percent of um, renewable as uh, renewable energy. So, in in a yeah, absolutely. Well, I think we just lost Nasser, but but for just a moment, we'll come back. But it's a perfect transition to you, Deborah, because. You know, I mean, these conversations are very familiar in the United States as well in terms of the need for some sort of infrastructure investment. But Nasser was also talking, and since we're talking about India, um, about the need to attract private capital and what those elements are that will attract private capital. Um, I, I'm just wondering whether from your vantage point, what you see as the key ingredients for that. Oh, thank, thank you, Clifton. Let me, I, I do want to make a comment about the past, present, future, if I may. Because, yeah, please, please. Because I'm trained as a classical archaeologist, and when I was at Cambridge, I came to India to study the Harappan civilization, which is one of the great Bronze Age civilizations, and then, of course, got involved with the Rajput and Mughal history. And what's really powerful here is that India has been an innovation nation from its inception, really. And so today, with the new narrative, drawing on this past and the present and where we're going, I see so many of the ingredients there that are going to just turbocharge a future. So also, you know, I have to say that in 1988, I was in the Reagan White House and I was the staff person in charge of the Reagan Gandhi Science and Technology Initiative. And when we came, I came with the science advisor and we, you know, visited all the incredible Indian institutes of science and technology and had our meetings with senior officials. But what was really exciting, and I always remember, is we were in the early days of seeing what was happening in Bangalore. Mm -hmm. And why was this area transforming? And yes, capital infusions were part of it, but it was also an incredible decision that the Indian government made at the time, which was counterintuitive. They put copyright protection on software masks. 
which was not, you know, India in those days was not really in the, in the vanguard of, of, quote, protecting intellectual property. I strongly believe, had they not done that, we would not have seen the infusion of capital and the whole transformation of Bangalore and the IT industry. So the access to capital at an innovation enabling environment, whether it's, you know, regulation, tax policy, all of that has to be knit together. And this is why it's an extremely exciting time now to turbocharge India's innovation future when we're coming out of the COVID pandemic. And there's just, so the future is great, but right now we're in this transitional stage. Yeah, you know, and Dr. Murtaza uh, uh, Korakabala, thank you for joining us. I know we were a little, a little bit late getting out of, out of the gate here, uh, but you, um, but of course, you're the managing director at at Walkhart, um, and when you talk about one of the one of the engines of Indian innovation, it's the pharmaceutical industry, uh, where you guys uh, have been leading in many cases, certainly in terms of vaccine production, um, um, and. You know, tell me a little bit about, from this perspective of narrative, how that's changing. How have you moved from the area where Anisha's father began uh, with the uh, the generic pharmaceutical industry and sort of helped launch that to sort of the, the new uh, innovation engines that we've, we're seeing? Yeah, thank you, Frank. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here at the Horace's event. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, innovation is the uh, bedrock of uh, pharmaceutical industry. And uh, what we did in about the last 30 years is as an industry, uh, we became extremely strong in the generic medicine. And today, about one in third medicine that is uh, sold in the uh, United States uh, is manufactured in India. So as an industry, we have uh, become extremely strong in generic. We have got a global uh, reach, global, global presence, and have pro proved our competitiveness in ge uh, generic space. I think what the challenge and what the opportunity for us today is to move from generic space to innovative space. And I think that is where uh, Indian companies are kind of moving ahead in that direction. Uh, if you see the kind of uh, focus that is there in biologicals, I think that is a step uh, in that direction. Uh, the kind of success that we have got in vaccines uh, is something that is also a great opportunity for all of us. But uh, fundamentally, I think that if we have to move from generic to innovative space, there are three or four things that are required. One mm -hmm. is a very important focus in innovation. Uh, and for innovation to succeed, uh, three, four important elements are required. One is a mindset of taking risk uh, is very important. Mm -hmm. I think as, an, as a country, as a population, I think taking risk is something that we have not, is not inherently present in our DNA. So the mindset of taking risk, being an entrepreneur and taking risk at a big level. Today, so, we have an amount of financial uh, muscle that we have got over the last 20 years in becoming large enough to take risk. Uh, but that is very important. And I may just add one more aspect. Uh, second is as a nation and as a country, uh, the whole idea of creating an innovation-led or a research-led nation is very important. And that involves a lot from a legal point of view, economic point of view, infrastructure point of view, in creating those ecosystems that will allow innovation and research to succeed. Yeah, see, that's a perfect transition to you, Anish, because you're you're new in a job, right? You're a couple of, couple of months into this new, very big job running Mahindra and Hindra. Um, it's a mass company. You've got 250,000 employees. You've got 20 some odd industries that you lead in. Um, you know, this is how do you develop that risk culture in uh, with in and in, 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 was was really talking about something very you know germane to to this sort of Indian entrepreneurialism. There is a little bit of that risk avoidance in that in, at least historically, right? Um, talk a little bit about how you get there. So I would say, Cliff, that a lot has been happening over the last few years. There's a lot more confidence in India today as multiple industries are able to manufacture world-class world -class product. Even if you look at the auto industry, for example, um, if you were to go back 20 years, 
there were various folks who were forecasting that Mahindra would be out of the auto industry because you had so many global players coming in. And Mahindra has managed to stay in there and make cars that are very competitive uh, with all the global players. Uh, mm -hmm. Similarly, you see that across many other industries. As that happens, there's a lot more confidence that's built uh, in companies in India. Uh, we're starting to see that on the entrepreneurial space as well. And we're starting to see bigger bets that are being made. The solar industry in India that uh, was referred to by Nasser is a yeah. class example. Uh, and India is starting to lead the world in that space. So I think it is a function of the ability to compete. And as that has increased, we're going to start seeing much bigger bets being made. Mm -hmm. I, want to, I want to talk a little bit about some of the challenges. Again, in this narrative, of course, there's an inherent conflict, right, that we have to overcome. And one of those is this still enormous gap between the haves and have-nots. Uh, we've seen this across the board, not just in terms of access to capital, in terms of livelihoods, uh, you know, after, for example, uh, the first lockdown in COVID, you had all of these migrant workers in India from, from rural areas basically just out of out of work and sort of you know waiting to get get home. Um, there, there there really is this sort of deep divide here in this country, and there is in the United States as well. But I, so I, and, and in other nations. But um, but how do you deal with that, Nasser, in terms of of changing the narrative? And one one thing I'd like to just point out is is the sort of penetration of vaccine, um, the distribution of vaccine, uh, COVID-19 vaccine to the population, where, where right now the latest numbers, um, according to some world authorities, are, are under 7% of the population are fully dosed in terms of vaccine. So, Nasser, maybe you can address that. Yeah, actually, it's a very important question. Um, the part of this narrative is the, uh, is the uh, cost of doing business. I think this is the bottom line. India is too costly to do anything, to set up anything. A, a, a shoemaker will have to go through 35 licenses. If he's going to even get off the ground on, on a store front. Now, this is what holds us back. Mm -hmm. Simplify. My, my mantra for India is simplify. We are too complicated in the way we do things. It's the overhead of the old Russian Soviet system of planning. Um, so simplify. The biggest problem we are facing today, in my view, uh, uh, while a lot of the major companies are doing well today, even the cement, the steel, the pharmaceuticals, the automo uh, automotive industry, not bad, it's, it's up there. The problem is that the small and medium scale industry are in very bad shape. Uh, and unemployment rate has gone through the roof. Uh, in May alone, 15 million people hit the unemployment uh, roads. So in a sense, we have to now build economic activity, build it up again, and we have to also understand how we're going to do that. How will we have the multiplier effects on employment, which will address the inequality problem? Because unless you can deal with employment, you're not going to be able to deal with, uh, with, uh, with uh, the incomes of the small guy, uh, the SME. SMC, et cetera. You have to get them back into employment. So I think the narrative for India today, if I, if I was up there, I would say the first is to really have the best macroeconomic management minds we can find. Because today, India has been very weak in macroeconomic management. We don't have the right people. We have not applied our minds to how we might look at the post-COVID situation. The potential is huge. The real possibilities are huge, but we need, as I call it, clarity of thinking, mm -hmm. consistency in the way we do things, and uh, commitment yeah. in terms of what we do. So if you have these three, you will attract capital, and we are going to re require huge amounts of capital to push into infrastructure. That And the infrastructure bank that the government has now announced is a very good idea, I think. Because, but it's only a good idea if it is staffed well, if it's led well, if you have good people running it, not uh, retired bureaucrats. Or something. <laughs> you have to turn the thing around. You have to have a completely new mindset of how this is going to happen. Yes. The potential is huge, but we need the right people leading from the top. 
for all those retired bureaucrats watching, you know, I, we welcome you anyway, you know, even if we don't want you to necessarily run, run the new infrastructure bank. Right, um, right. You know, Deborah, uh, you know, it, it, yeah, go ahead. On, go ahead. On, on go two ahead. points. One is yeah. on vaccination. I just want to share that as of yesterday, uh, India actually has given 428 million doses of vaccination. So while you're right that only 9% have received both doses, it's a function of time. Uh, yeah. Because it's close to about 27 or 28 percent who received the first dose, and uh, because of the 13-week period that uh, we've had for AstraZeneca vaccine, it will be a function of time. But it's ramping up very well today. Yeah, yeah. yes, we have further to go. But 428 million is probably higher where the US is in terms of number of uh, vaccines given. And the second point I'll say is while you talk talk rightly about the divide, uh, the one thing that we see in India, which we may not see in some other countries is that a lot of the large companies are driven by purpose and are starting to lead ESG. And I can talk about the Mahindra Group because living a purpose is a primary goal in a sense. Uh, and that is about enabling our communities to rise. So as a company does well, it's done well on the back of having a communities rise. So that mindset is one that will help India in terms of bridging that gap better. Yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's interesting, you know, you know, we talked a lot about the sort of overwhelming entrepreneurial drive of, of, in the, of the Indian people. There's also this sense of importance of country, of nationhood, of, uh, and of lifting up, you know, the fellow countrymen, which is really important. And I think that sense of purpose is important. One thing, though, that, that, um, that Nasser mentioned was the regulation. And I know that uh, uh, your prime minister, your president, Narendra Modi, um, uh, you know, one of his first acts was to sort of, you know, put do away with certain regulation by fiat, put it out there, try to open up the spigot, if you will. But still, when you're dealing with with trying to go from one state to another, if you want to do business in <clears throat> Uttar Pradesh versus Maharashtra or Kerala, you go through all sorts of different regulate regulation barriers there. And Deborah, I want to come to you first, but I'd love to throw this to everyone. Imagine if a business in Indiana had to have a whole new set of rules just to work across the state line in Illinois or in, in Michigan. It, it, would, it would make it very difficult to develop very large industries. And um, so talk a little bit about how you overcome that barrier. Oh, Deborah, why don't we start with you? Yeah. Uh, yes. Well, Sorry, yeah. You know, the whole set of regulations are huge for innovation capacity. And, and even in the United States, we're seeing many, many challenges around this. At the U.S. Council on Competitiveness, we call this, do you have a regulatory environment that's innovation friendly or hostile? And I would say in India that there is a whole web, not just of regulations, but bureaucracy and practices and mm -hmm. culture that are very innovation hostile. And they also lead to the massive inequality and the urban rural divide. So for instance, land ownership and agriculture and access to clean water. You know, India has huge challenges around sustainability in food, water, and energy. And the barriers to address that are all in this web of, of really, as, as colleagues have said, some of the old style Soviet central planning regulations. So I would recommend you know, that, that in the private sector, I mean, we have in the U.S. Council on Competitiveness, our CEOs, university presidents, labor leaders. We just, you know, met last week with two cabinet secretaries in energy and commerce who are taking our agenda moving forward on innovation. There needs yeah. to be that type of leadership. Leaders are here working with the government and really have a, a innovation regulatory czar and see how you can cut through these because it's almost as if you have Gulliver who's being held down by the Lilliputians and the Lilliputians, <laughs> all of this, you know, strain of, of legacy and cultural things. So I do hope we'll come back to the issue about diversity and inclusivity because yeah. yes, it's huge for everybody in the world, but there are really serious issues in India around this um, that need to be addressed in the urban rural divide. I, I'd love to come back to that, but I would love to get uh, Murtaza and, and Anish talking a little bit about some of their sort of regulatory barriers, if, if, if you would. Uh, Murtaza, why don't we talk with you? Start with yeah. you. Uh, you know, we had an uh, experience in developing uh, new chemical entities 
for the first time in India, we have been doing the visit over the last 20 years. And about two years back, or three years back, uh, we wanted to introduce these new chemical entities in India. And these are originally drug research products that we have developed in antibiotic space. Now, the experience that we had is that the competency and the capability of Indian regulators to understand the innovation, to understand research, and to understand how to uh, uh, give approvals for products that are developed is just not there. Uh, with the same molecules, we went to US, we went to UK, we went to European Union. And the way the innovation ecosystem in terms of regulatory framework is developed is they have understanding of innovation, they have understanding of the various uh, aspects of drug development and approval. So I think one of the important things is within the regulatory framework, as far as the pharmaceutical and life science industry is there, is developing the right competency and capacity within our regulatory framework. Uh, I can touch upon other aspects of how to encourage innovation in pharmaceutical industry, but one aspect is competency and uh, capability. Building. Another very important aspect is financial aspect. Now, pharmaceutical industry, uh, for a new product or new chemical entity to come, takes about 10 to 15 years and requires large amount of investment, uh, maybe in a uh, billion dollars, a hundred million dollars. And if you're in India, maybe much less because of the cost dynamics which are there. But what government can uh, probably do is encourage in creating an innovation ecosystem. And that is a linkage between universities and education, industry on the other hand, and uh, the uh, financial part, the venture capital, the startup uh, ecosystem which is there. So creating innovation ecosystem which is there in the US, which is in Sweden, which is in UK, can play a great role in terms of uh, promoting uh, innovation. Anish, can I ask you to just sort of address this question? Yeah. Uh, I would go back uh, to what Nasser mentioned around simplicity. Uh, in many cases, uh, regulations are based on uh, older rules that have not been fully simplified as yet. What we also see a dichotomy. In some cases, we are well ahead of many other countries. If you look at the tech stack, for example, that's developed with Aadhaar, with the payment system, uh, where banks can tap into it, the credit bureaus that, that exist as well. I think that's a very sophisticated stack that allows the fintech industry to start uh, really going forward on a very different plane. Uh, but in some other cases, we are behind. And uh, mm -hmm. that simplicity that Nasser mentioned is really what's required. Uh, that itself will make a huge difference. I would just jump in and say, though, that this point that's been raised about the expertise in government to understand these technology revolutions and what they mean in terms of wealth creation and how they need to be regulated. One example, in the nuclear energy field, we have a nuclear regulatory commission in the United States that's still regulating around 1950, 1960 technology. There's no expertise for small modular reactors, the whole transformation of that industry. So that's something where the private sector working with the government can actually help on that and not see people who are in these safety, health, very important regulatory mandates is just sort of low-level bureaucrats. There needs to be training, expertise, and respect because without that capability of talent, you know, we're not going to be able to move forward in an innovation-friendly regulatory environment that also protects safety and health. Yeah. One of the things I love about Harassus is that we have this unbelievable group of people who are uh, listening in and participating uh, in the conversations. And we have a question uh, from Mahesh Koteka, uh, the CEO of Structured Credit. Would you would you just go ahead and make your comment and uh, and question for the group, Mahesh? He's muted. Oh, uh, you have to unmute. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, can you can you hear me? That's you. Yes, we can. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? All right. Yes. Good. Well, first of all, congratulations on an excellent panel wide-ranging and very astute and insightful comments. I listened to Nazar Manji, my good friend from days gone by, when he led the form business plan for the formation of Infrastructure Development Finance Corporation, where I had a small footnote that I added to that plan. 
And I'm glad to see that the government about 25, 30 years later is trying to finally do something about that business plan, which was abandoned by IDFC 2015 uh, because of lack of complex, because of complexity and other such things that he has referred to. Uh, infrastructure to me is the biggest Achilles heel in India. And unfortunately, you are stuck there with the complexity and the smartness of the government. Uh, the government is actually made up of brilliant people, but they are wedded to the brilliance that came from the Fabian socialist society and maybe has not graduated since the Manmohan days and they need to do so. So I'd like to actually ask Mazam Manji how he envisions the implementation of the NAFID, uh, the National uh, Infrastructure Bank and why won't we have the guarantee company that I penned as a business plan portion in the Infrastructure Development, Finan uh, Infrastructure Development Finance Corporation, IDFC, that we still need today to reduce the risks so, so investments can be made in infrastructure to boost the economic growth rate, to bring the poor people back at a faster rate than it would be possible otherwise. Thank you. Great, great question. Nasser. Uh, it's, you know, it's taking one hour to answer, Mahesh, <laughs> uh, in terms of what the Infrastructure Bank ought to do, and I'm going to have a separate conversation with him uh, separately, and we've been promising to do so. Um, but I think here is a real opportunity. I've been arguing for a development bank for infrastructure for a long time. Um, and it's been capitalized at 20,000 crores, which is a lot of money. Uh, and the government has put its back behind it. Uh, so I think here is a great opportunity for India. India needs $5 trillion of investment in infrastructure over the next four to five years. That's the sort of money we need. I've always said that in India, we, the, we, we get the loose change that foreigners give us uh, to be in India, to just test us out, uh, to see how things go. Now, if you look at what's happening to Cairns and Cairn Energy, to Vodafone, to Etisalat, to, to Amazon, to Flipkart, to almost anybody who we've invited into India, they are in trouble with with some regulation, some legal issues, something. Um, so in a sense, these are very, very wrong messages. Uh, we need huge amounts of capital. We have to give certainty and consistency in what we do. Infrastructure is not going to work on domestic investment capacity. It just got, doesn't have it. The government doesn't have it. And today the private sector is not in a position to bring out their private investment because they're so worried about their own sector. And they're worried about uh, preserving their capital for their own uh, thing. They're not going to go into risk uh, capital in infrastructure where the legal system is not clear, the policy system is not clear. So I think the infrastructure bank will have to clarify, simplify, create a whole commitment to and sequence um, infrastructure investments in a logical way and be a protector of that whole process. Um, but I think this is a broader issue. I don't want to go deeper into it, but it's a real opportunity. But it will require the best minds we can find um, to, to, to manage from the chairman, CEO, and the, the senior management team to have a very flexible, innovative, creative approach. Uh, otherwise, uh, I think we are in trouble. Thank you. Thank you uh, for that comment, Nasser, and for your question, Mahesh. I'm going to just, uh, great, perfect. Um, so I want to, you know, we haven't yet talked about this sort of larger than life challenge, uh, COVID-19, and particularly the second wave that we saw with, with the Delta variant in India and how devastating that was. In all of the great narratives in history, there is that sort of larger-than-life force that the protagonist is fighting against. Um, and so, uh, Murtaza, I, you know, I, want, I would love to ask you about the sort of sense of preparedness and vulnerability uh, that, you know, we're, you know, we saw just India be absolutely devastated by this wave. And we're seeing, obviously, that... that, that second and third and fourth wave happened in all the other countries, including the United States. But in India's case, with 400,000 new cases in a day, you know, where you had 40,000 deaths, I mean, you know, in a single, you know, fell swoop, 
I mean, it was just remarkable for the world to see. And how do you take not just the investment in infrastructure, but the investment in public health infrastructure to make sure that the Indian people are safe from another one of these kinds of events? Yes, I think uh, as uh, Anish mentioned, it is only a function of time that because we have about 1.2 billion uh, population, and while we are vaccinating between 5 million to 10 million people, uh, vaccination doses per day, uh, one expects that by an, in another six months, we would be able to vaccinate about at least 50 to 60 percent of our population uh, would get vaccinated. And I think at that point of time, uh, the way the UK is going and the way Singapore is going, that uh, COVID infection would just become one of the infections that are there and would not be, uh, most of them because of vaccination would either have a mild infection and in very few and rare cases would have a severe infection. Mm -hmm. So I think we would be uh, beyond uh, uh, the pandemic kind of lockdown and situation that we are today in another six to eight months time as far as India is concerned. But coming to the larger issue of public health and creating the health infrastructure for uh, the large muscles that are there, you're absolutely right. Today, uh, government invests about one, one and a half percent of the GDP of public health. And that is totally inadequate in creating the right uh, infrastructure for health. Uh, we need to look at increasing that to at least three, three and a half percent. That would mean an in investment of about 40 to 50 billion dollars a year. And I think that goes into everything. That goes into education, that goes into creating the right uh, treatment facilities, the diagnostic facilities, the doctors, the nurses, uh, uh, incentivizing innovation within the pharmaceutical industry to take care of India's specific needs. Uh, so I think there is a huge amount of uh, uh, a long road to travel in terms of creating the health infrastructure which is required. Uh, coming to innovation again, I think one of the very important things that India can do is creating an innovation fund uh, specific to life science and pharmaceuticals. We have seen that in US and UK and some of the other countries, uh, there is a government funded innovation program for the industry. And that allows industry to take risk and uh, develop new molecules. And I think that is also very important from uh, our industry. Sunil Mehta, I know your, your camera's off. I don't know if we lost you or if we can bring you back here for a second. But, um, but you know, one of the things that, that India has is this enormous and growing middle class. Uh, it's a huge economic engine. Um, and so, you know, in terms of their con sort of consumer spending, driving, you know, new industries, uh, I'd love to talk about the power of that in shaping the Indian narrative going forward. Sunil, I don't know if you're, if you can hear this question because your, your camera's off. Yeah, uh, my apologies for the camera. There's some problem I've had, some difficulty. No, okay, no worries at all. We just, we know you're here. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Well, uh, I'll, I'll just go ahead and respond to your question. So I think the uh, point that you make about the growing Indian middle class, I would like to add that there is a, a rising, uh, in what was seen as the economic disadvantage class as well. So if you would start with what happened in 2014-15 in the banking sector, with the Prime Minister and his team driving the opening of bank accounts of uh, uh, the bottom of the pyramid, so with the addition of about 400 million new bank accounts uh, that have been added since then, uh, it actually adds a huge firepower for consumption right at the grassroots level. And this connectivity, particularly that has been done on a digital basis, uh, that has been sort of growing on a very rapid, this will actually leapfrog uh, in that, into that space that uh, of consumption levels are growing, not just for the Indian middle class, but what we have seen for the uh, rural masses as well. And I and if you see uh, the trend that have taken place over the last several years, the economic activity uh, in even under COVID one, the economic activity was pretty strong. Uh, as the rural consumption was still growing it. 
So I think the Indian middle class and the the huge um, aspir- aspiring Indian lower middle class, which is sort of coming in, will be driving the exactly the consumption power of this country. And I I would say that the Indian financial system has to gear up to be able to meet the demands of this new resurgent uh, consuming power of i would say the close to 6 to 800 million people mm. that will be there and it's not just the banking it's the microfinance the micro insurance uh, the insurance sector the wealth preservation sector which is you know the what we see from what is regulated in the securities and exchange board of india uh, all of this needs to sort of work in tandem and i was listening to some of my other speakers about the required regulatory architecture one of the important elements that will need to be there is how do we have a very strong integrated regulatory architecture that is going to support this growth so um, this element of uh, typically our regulations historically and it's nothing to do with this dispensation or the other historically the regulations precede the growth in the market uh it also sort of actually gets uh catalyzed when there is blood on the streets and that's when the new regulatory system sort of comes in and to kind of get uh, uh remodeled to to meet the needs of the, the market so i would say that this is one of the needs that will be seen not just in india but i think this would be a global connect that like leave yeah. that on the table as to how india can also take the lead yeah. in creating that uh, regulatory architecture well we just have a few minutes left and no great uh, narrative is complete without a great ending right um so we i would love to ask each of these and we only have about 30 seconds for each of you to sort of tell me what the ending is of this narrative um uh, and you know deborah let me start with you since we've got this sort of outside perspective uh Uh, with that what's the ending for this narrative the ending is to bring together the talent the technology the investment and the infrastructure to turbocharge innovation deliver this prosperity and growth and on the health issue india has been a great leader in telehealth and developing the cheapest covid testing i think the only way to move forward is to really set up the infrastructure for telemedicine and telehealth in india okay anish for everyone Anish, what's the ending of this great narrative for the Indian people? <laughs> Anish, you're muted. Anish. You're muted. I'm, I'm afraid we had to do at least once in doing this conversation, right? So, uh, absolutely. So the ending I would say is uh, a much bigger and bolder bet in India across multiple industries. Uh, India leading the world in multiple industries as well. uh and thereby creating a much stronger base not just for the middle class but for the emerging class to do that as well uh, i think india is always well for the future in a de- in a democracy it does take time sometimes to get everything together uh but i'm very optimistic in terms of where we headed today okay mortaz uh, oh, we have a uh, just a few seconds left go ahead yeah so i would look at it as a short term and a long term uh in the short term i think all the things that have been mentioned earlier in terms of regulation in terms of innovation funding in terms of creating investment in public health will be extremely important in the medium to long term i think it is education uh we need to invest in large amount of education and skill building uh, for the industry and for innovation and i think we have great institutes in india but i think we need to do a lot okay sunil um i i share the same optimism as the uh, preceding speakers of there's a huge potential but i think i would like to caveat that with there's a lot to be done in building our institutional infrastructure and if uh, we can build a very strong institutional infrastructure i think that will provide uh, a strong catalyst and a platform for growth great Nasser you get the last word in this great panel. Nasser words. I want to I want to quote Seneca. Uh if you do not know to which port you are sailing no wind is favorable. 
So I think in a sense, what I'm trying to say is that India has got enormous, frighteningly amazing potential. Um, but what we need to do is bring down the cost of doing business within the India, make life simple, and to improve the living environment in which people live. Because the efficiency of our city is today way behind what they ought to be. So there's a huge thing to concentrate on these two things, the living environment and the cost of doing business. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. What a great conversation. Thank you all. This was really a fantastic uh, plenary. Thank you. Thank you. Really great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing it. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.